But now we can go really deep into strategy. You see that light bulb just turn on in their minds. That just sends shivers up my spine when that happens. Yeah. Well, it's so fun for all of us and the team too, who love to work on strategy. And everybody wants time to work on strategy, but we, we've got to make the time. Like the system actually makes the time. So we have time to dive deep. Welcome to Tip Top, Grow Up Your Business with Metronomics. Join me, Shannon Burns Susco, and Metronomics Certified Coach, Jed Roberts. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, stories, and how you can grow your company up at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. I'm super excited to have Jed Roberts with us today for our time together. Now, Jed's a metronomics coach based in Australia. Uh, He's been working with high growth companies for quite a while, lots of different industries. And we'll talk more about this. We're going to dig into this. I'm just giving you a high level view. Um, Jed is specializes in, you know, leadership teams to align strategy, culture, execution, and Jed's been using the metronomics growth operating system for more than five years. Jed, do I have that right? More than five That's years. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, the thing I love about Jed and we'll, we'll dig into this is Jed's approach is really practical, really practical. It's results driven and it really gets a lot of the teams that he's working with in driving our three year highly achievable goal. And we're going to dig into Jed's insights on coaching, on high growth companies, on leadership. So let's let's dive in. So, Jed, here we go. Tables turn. First question. Um, can you start by sharing um, a little bit about your journey to become a metronomics coach. And then what was the turning point that sort of led you, you know, into this field of coaching and impacting high growth companies? Well, I, I never thought I would end up as a coach is probably a good place to start. You know, that was just not in my mind when I first started out. So I've got a really eclectic past, as, as you know, I, I ran away to sea when I was 16. Um, and there's not too many people that can say that these days. Uh, so I um, I ran away to sea and joined the British Merchant Navy and spent seven years sailing around the world, uh, you know, seeing sights that sort of you know, young impressionable people should probably not see, um, which which was really character building and and very very formative. Uh, and I ended up spending some time um, in Australia in the um, late 80s um, and um, meeting someone and uh, you know the rest, as they say, is history. I ended up sort of you know deciding that uh, that that. Being at sea was probably no longer compatible compatible with putting down some roots. Uh, so I trained as an engineer originally, um, and when I came ashore, um, I went back to school and I studied naval architecture, and I worked in ship design for a very, very old company. Um, this company is older than quite a few modern countries. It's over 270 years old, uh, Lloyd's Register. Uh, and from there, I, um, I moved into software, uh, and then... Pretty much, well, pretty much totally by accident, I ended up running software businesses. Um, and so you know, I, I went from being a sort of you know, a software guy, you know, a, a developer or an architect, um, and um, then just ended up running businesses, running business units, and then running businesses. And um, without really realizing it, I, I realized one day that um, I was running a $30 million business and I had sort of 120 people working for me. And, uh, and I, and it was certainly not, certainly not by design, not by design. Um, but I don't think I was very prepared for that. So I, I, I don't think I had the skills and the experience to be able to do that. Um, and I, and I burnt out. I got to a point where I was just frazzled, absolutely frazzled. So I probably made, um, in retrospect, was uh, you know probably not the most sensible decision. I left and I started a startup. <laughs> if if I was frazzled before, I was certainly frazzled afterwards. So I did, I did three companies in a row. Um, and in 2015, when I exited my last business, um, uh, which, um, wasn't successful, let's just put that out there right now. It wasn't very successful at all. Um, I 
got to a point where I realized that I just couldn't do another startup. I just could not, I just did not have the energy to do another startup. So um, I asked around, spoke to a few people that I used to um, you know, work with or you know, worked for, you know, managers that I'd worked for previously. And um, one of them said, well, why don't you do what I do? And I said, well, that sounds awesome. What, what do you do? And he told me about all what he was doing as a coach. He was a scaling up coach. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I was on, the, on a plane to Atlanta in Georgia uh, to do my scaling up training, which is uh, where we first met in uh, 2015, 2016. I can't remember if it was the end of 2015 or early 2016. So, so since then, this is my 10th year of coaching. Um, and um, I absolutely love it. It's been an incredible journey. And I think I get as much enjoyment out of helping a dozen CEOs achieve what they want. I probably get more enjoyment out of that than building my own businesses. I, I'm probably also a far better coach than I am a CEO. <laughs> but I got to go back and ask you. So, you know, you, you, you're a part of and built a division up, you know, in one sense. You leave that. You start another company, you start another company, you start another company. What were some of the uh, commonalities of challenges that you were faced with when in each of those situations? You know, was there any col commonality? Well, what were some of the things that, you know, you remember? And uh, maybe it wasn't so funny then, but it's a little clearer now. Oh, well, I think, you know, the, the first thing was starting a starting a startup and then realizing I knew nothing about marketing and sales. Absolutely nothing. Um, and um, the fact that trying to start a product startup was totally different to running a services company. You know, I'd moved from a professional services business with, where we were basically, you know, doing projects or selling consultants out for, you know, for hire uh, and going from there to actually building a software platform and then selling it as a product um, that was totally, totally different. Um, and the fact I could sell people, but selling products was just something I had never, ever done before. And how do you do, how did you do marketing when you weren't actually marketing someone's skills? That was totally, totally new to me. Yeah, it's totally, totally different. So, so that was, um, that was certainly a challenge. Um, and, um, I, I think I got around that really, but just by working with, with experts in their own field. And I guess you know, early on, I realized that I didn't have to be great at everything. You know, as long as there was a good person on the team and I knew enough to be able to you know, ask the right questions rather than do it myself, that was probably a big learning learning for me. It didn't make me very comfortable though, because I was I was a probably still am I'm a bit of a control freak. I want I wanted to be able to do everything, but I can't. Yeah, I, I love that you touch on that because it's at the end of the day, we know leadership's the number one barrier to growth. And it's leadership actually letting go and finding the right who, who can take on the how, right? And I think we all learn that as we grow up as leaders. Uh, and, and I think your experience was, was not much different than what, you know, a lot of the companies we coach. And it's, you know, really getting that visibility. Now, when you, when you ended up and when we first met, um, yeah, we met at a training at uh, Scaling Up um coaching what drew you to metronomics what drew you to the metronomics growth system and how has it impacted you know the businesses you work with yep yep look i'm a huge fan of scaling up i think it's an awesome system and i think for a long time it was the it was the leader in the field um i think it was what what drew me to metronomics was probably getting a copy of um your book the three hag way in uh, in New Orleans at a at a conference a couple a few years after we'd met so probably three years after we'd met and I I knew that you were writing books and I I had a copy of the metronome effect and I I liked that uh, but what drew me to metronomics and it wasn't metronomics then it was you know the three hag coaches uh, was the fact that you'd put together a strategy system uh, and you put together a strategy system that worked for all sides of all sizes of businesses. Now from a really small business to a really, really large business. Uh, and going back to my previous days when I was in consulting, I used to spend three months working with a company to craft a, you know, a 200 page strategy document. 
um, that I probably knew was never, ever going to get looked at after the first initial presentation to the executive team. Uh, but to move from that and then suddenly realize, well, actually, there's an easier way. We can craft strategy in a, in a, by following a process rather than just trying to pull buzzwords and theme words out of uh, a bunch of um, you know, senior leaders' uh, interviews. Uh, and it, being able to join the dots between that strategic process uh, was, was really what made me go, ah, there is something different in this. There is something that I really like. It's not just a box where you put your purpose and your core values and your three to five year goals. Now, it, it, was a, it was a distinct process. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Um, and I'm a, I'm a process guy. I love models. I love tools. So give me a process, a model that I can follow and apply and to learn and teach others, then um, yeah, you've got me. Yeah. You know, I love that you bring up strategy as a process and that was attractive and it's been attractive to so many people and it still is today. But the thing that I got you know, sort of caught up as well with was, you know, being told strategy is a thing. Like strategy is a thing. And I was like, well, isn't strategy a process? Isn't strategy a like an ongoing system? You know, and that's what led, you know, me to Three Hegway, actually creating Three Hegway and really taking the best of, you know, the the best out there of all our strategic uh, thought leaders and all their what's and like putting it into that paint by numbers strategy system. So because that's the thing that, you know, ties it together from what we know about execution and cash all the way through to culture, right? That strategy piece in the middle. So when you're working, because I love that you shared that, when you're working as a coach with a company that you're implementing the metronomics growth operating system with, um, how do you introduce it to a leadership team that may not be familiar with the system? What are the first steps? I mean, really, uh, as coaches, we, we continue to make impact with clients and we leverage the system to actually, you know, make a, a greater impact sooner. How do you get, how do you get started? Well, I think the, the thing that really resonates with me when I'm working on strategy with clients is that no one really knows how to craft strategy. So if you put in front of people a system that makes sense, they'll, they'll follow it. They'll follow it because they didn't know that you could craft strategy. Now, that they, if they've done strategy before, it probably isn't strategy. It's probably more coming up with some strategic themes that have no real connection to any data or any, um, you know, or any validation process. Um, so they think they know strategy, but they don't. And they pretty quickly realize that they don't know strategy. And what they've got in their business is probably just more of a plan or a, or a set of aspirations that you can't really connect to anything, anything of substance, anything real. You know, and, and almost certainly not something that they're actually moving towards you know, month by month, quarter by quarter, year by year. You know, you know, they look back three years later and go, well, we didn't do that and we didn't achieve that because they hadn't put, put anything in place to actually get there. But, but, but I think what I love about the three hag way is um, I, I, I'm a big believer in the slow reveal. You tell people enough of what they need to know for that point in time. Um, and you know, at some point... You, you get a question back from a CEO and say, and they'll say, um, ah, okay, so we've got our differentiators and we've just built out our swim lanes. So they're pretty, pretty far through the process at that point. And so we've got our strategic roadmap. And those milestones on the swim lanes, they're going to be our priorities for the next quarter. Is that right? Is that what they are? That's, that's right. That's right. But you're not explaining that as you're going through the process. You know, they're going to work it out for themselves at some point. You know, and then maybe a quarter later, they go, okay, so we've got our 36-month rolling P&L. We've now got our metrics for the next quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter and the next quarter. That's, so, and at some point, they're also going to say, well, okay, you know, we've now got all of this in place. We know what our priorities are probably going to be next quarter and the quarter after that and over the year, and we know what our numbers are going to be. What do we spend our time on when we do planning now and when we meet every quarter? And it's like, well, now we can go really deep 
into strategy because we've now cleared all the detail out of the way and we can now really, really go deep in strategy. And you, you see that light bulb just turn on in their minds. And that, yeah, that, that just sends shivers up my spine when that happens. Yeah. Well, it's so fun for all of us and, and, and the team too, who love to work on strategy, right? And everybody wants time to work on strategy, but we, we've got to make the time. Like the system actually makes the time. So we have time to dive deep. Can you like maybe share some of the, the challenges that when you're working with leaders and they're working on their, their three hack for the first time, what are some of the challenges you've experienced? And so that, you know, as, as you talked about, you know, this, it's almost like seeing the light. What, what are the challenges when you first work on a three hag with a, with a new client? To be honest, I don't normally see many challenges on working, on working through with a three hag to begin with, because it's such a simple process and people just get it that it's it's almost um it's refreshing because they've they've never really been given the opportunity to have these sorts of conversations as a leadership team now that, that I, I don't i don't understand why but those conversations don't seem to happen in businesses now and you, know, you say to a ceo i'm going to get the whole leadership team in the room you know we're going to talk through things we're going to have difficult discussions we're going to argue we're going to debate you know we're going to convince we're going to cajole we're going to persuade and you know, and what we come out with, you're all going to be aligned with. And, you know, you're all going to be aligned on. And they look at you as if you're crazy. Well, we can't do that in a day. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Yeah, it's even hard to just tell them that. <laughs> That's going to be the outcome. I love how you said, like, it's just enough. You just need to know enough for right now. And then we share a little bit more, share a little bit more. But the big ahas are amazing. Now, when we think about um, the work you've done with clients and the work we do with clients with 3HAG and the growth operating systems, um, we think about confidence. And you released a book in June, at the end of June, Growth with Confidence. And can you tell, tell us a little bit about that book? Yes, uh, and it's awesome. I love what you have on the cover, by the way, the golden metronome. <laughs> There's nothing better than that. Um, can you t talk a little bit about your book? Um, it's been out since June. Tell, tell us how it's going and, and, and what that, what was the main reason you, sh you called it? I always am curious about title and then, uh, you know, w from your perspective around the book. Yep. Well, what, what we do really is about developing confidence, developing confidence in execution, developing confidence in strategy. Uh, and unless you've got that confidence, you're not going to get that growth that you're that you want. Now, and you know the growth that allows you to balance, you know, your your life and your business. Uh, so I sort of landed on the title of growth with confidence because that's what I was seeing with the with the CEOs and the leadership teams that I work on. You now we they walk into a into a quarterly meeting after you know one two years of working together, and they just have this confidence. They know what's going to happen. They know the process. You know, and there's, there's no more guessing anymore. There's no more guessing anymore. So they have the confidence that they can do what they want to do. And it's, you know, it's not going to be easy. It's never easy. But you know, they've, they've got the confidence. They've worked through all the options. Uh, so I came up with the idea of the book really when I was, I was seeing the same problems with the companies I was working with. And the subtitle is The 10 Business Challenges That Block Confident Growth. Uh, the same problems every single time. Um, and, you know, there's lots of books out there. And if you took all the the, biz, the great business books out there, all of those 10 challenges are covered in some way. But no one, no one from what I could see had actually brought those together just as a set of 10 challenges. Now, and the, the book doesn't go into how you fix those challenges in, in much detail. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy read. It's a simple read. You can, you can probably read it in 19 minutes. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to, make it a book that a CEO could pick up and go, yep, yeah, I've got that problem. I've got that problem. Ah, we have faced that all the time. Because often they've never, they never actually articulate, they never think through what are the key challenges that they're working on at any point in time. Uh, and I think most CEOs, if they picked up the book, they would probably, they would probably say, yeah, I've got at least four, if not five, if not six of those problems, those challenges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, You've worked with many leadership teams, 
um, the book Growth with Confidence is is about those challenges, right? What What's the most common challenge? And maybe that's too easy of a question to lob out there, but what's the most common challenge you see a team's face with? Yeah, well, that will be chapter one. It's the team, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> I, I deliberately went for quite emotive chapter titles because yes. you know, there's an element of, you know, you... You have to sort of know shock someone to actually get them to change yeah. their thinking. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the the reason is chapter one is because every single company I go into, it's the team. You know, it's the, it's the team, it's the people, and not that the people are bad. It's just that they're not necessarily the right people for that culture. They're not necessarily the right people for that role. Uh, they're not necessarily at the level that they need to be to perform as as they need. Uh, so you know, it's. It's inevitable that the team is going to change in some way in the first six to nine months, if not before. Uh, and sometimes they just haven't grown themselves. The business has grown. I'm I'm working with a new client at the moment, and they've gone from eighty million dollars to a hundred and fifty million dollars in the last eighteen months. Uh, so the business has nearly doubled, but the leadership team hasn't developed, and it's a massive, massive problem. Now and the CEO knows that he's probably going to have to replace himself and he's probably going to have to replace most of his leadership team over the next few months. And if he doesn't, they're not going to go any further and they'll probably fall back pretty spectacularly. Yeah, and it's all about, you know, there's team, leadership team, team. And when we see high growth, you know, we're, you know, I know this as a CEO, you know this uh, as well. We are running to keep up with the growth and to grow ourselves as fast as uh, the as the business is growing, what what are some of the things? So, you know that company the, the example you just provided is fantastic, right? We see companies that are, you know, doubling in growth. We're trying to double the capabilities, the competencies, you know, to keep up with. As a coach, you know, what what's that discussion? What 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 do we? How do we handle that? And when do we handle that? Yeah, well, as soon as possible is the answer. For the, you know, that is the answer I'd give. Uh, you, you know, you know, um, my core customer profile. You've got a fair idea of my core customer profile, and and the first thing I'm looking for is are they are they learners? Now, do they are they reading books? Are they developing themselves? Are they are they developing their professional and interpersonal capabilities? And are they doing that fast? Uh, because if they're not, they're probably not going to keep up. And you know, I now have my own book that I can give to people and ask the question, well, you know, what did you think of the book? And if they haven't read the book after I've given it to them two weeks previously, I'm thinking, yeah, you're maybe not a learner. You're maybe not going to be learning and teaching yourself fast enough to grow as, as you need to. So it's a really good way of actually working out, you know, does someone have that value? Are they learners? Are they lifelong learners? Yeah. And, you know, we we have to be growing ourselves and the team as fast as we're growing the business. Um, if that's number one challenge in your book, what's number 10? Number 10 is brand promise with the guarantee. How many companies have you gone into where they have some vaguely worded brand promise, but there's no guarantee attached? And th this this concept and, you know, is it a brand promise? Is it a customer promise? Is it a product promise? Whatever you want to call it. Unless you're prepared to back that up, uh, then you know you, it, it's worthless. It's toothless. It's a toothless tiger. But you should only do that, as you know, when you're confident that you can actually deliver on that brand promise. And uh, th this is something that several of my clients have been working through over the last six months. Uh, you know, one of them had a brand promise and they had a guarantee, but they weren't quite prepared, ready to to release it to the market. Um, and one day, one of the quarterly meetings, the team sat down and they said, we think we're ready. Yeah, we think we're ready to launch the brand promise with the guarantee. And they have. They've recently launched the guarantee. And uh, they, you know, they now have something that keeps them on track all the time because they're, they're always aware that if they have to pay out on that guarantee, it's going to cost them a lot of time, money, and effort. Uh, so they're now focused big, big time on execution to make sure that that never happens. Or if it happens, it happens for the right reasons, because sometimes it just happens. 
Yeah, well, congratulations with that because Brand po- Promise is is far around the three hag wheel, and it is on purpose. It, it's because we need to build that confidence in the strategy in order to ensure in order to ensure we're serving the number one need of the core customer who's going to be attracted to buy, and that the team's empowered to deliver on the guarantee if we don't deliver as you know the 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 brand promise uh you know articulates and says and it's the empowerment of the team aligned with the confidence in the strategy so congratulations on that because a lot of times we see a lot of brand promises out there well you know, i'm going to say yeah brand promises without guarantees but we even see some off the side of their hip brand promises with guarantees and they're not meeting the you know core customer's number one need right? We, we see that a lot. And it takes that, that step-by-step, you know, that process being alive for strategy to create the confidence. I love how your team is like, we're ready because they, they're, they're going to be confident that they're ready. We can release it. We got it. Their competitors are going to, their competitors are going to go, they're crazy. I can't believe they, you know, that's the kind of brand promise we want because they know they can deliver on it. What's the, what's, when, when we think about, you know, the different steps when we grow, you know, growth with confidence, what are some of the other things that we need to unlock in your opinion to ensure that teams can take, you know, this is a journey, it's a progression, it's step over step. What are some other, you know, sort of key steps in when we think of growth with confidence? Well, I mean, you've 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 seen the book, and uh, you're, you've you've probably worked out by now that this is a retelling of a lot of your work and a lot of work of other thought leaders. You had Jim Collins, Patrick Lynchoni, a whole bunch of others. Uh, and I think the the thing that probably makes the biggest impact is uh, you know right in the middle of the book when we talk about the key function flow map, where we talk about understanding you now those critical functions that bring money into the business, put money in the bank. Uh, and having a detailed understanding of the interrelationship and the interconnection between those functions, you know, and what drives what, you know, what are the things that you're moving through the business to to generate cash? And you know, this is another one of those things that always amazes me. You know, you walk into a into a new new client, a new leadership team, and as a leadership team, they don't all align on how the business makes money. How can you run a business like that? How can you run a business when the leadership team doesn't have clarity on how the yeah, company makes money? Pr- pretty difficult. But again, the process we're the process we're taking them through gives them that clarity in less than an hour. You know, I've had comments from clients where you know, you know uh, someone said to me, "I've learned more about this business in the last thirty minutes than I have done in the last nine months." You know, and you know. Comments like that, where you know the, the we, we've normally done that by eleven o'clock on day one, and uh, CEO said to me once, like, "Well, look, you know, it's we're two hours in. If this is all we get from the two days, then this has been worth it." Now that because, <laughs> and I know you sort of have a giggle because you're like, "Oh, this is just the start of our two day impact," and I love that. You know, the the key function flow map doesn't take very long to to create for any business. And the clarity it brings is exponential to to the leaders in the room and and to to just, you know, as you said, we're trying to grow a business. We need that foundation for our execution and to execute our strategy, you know, in order to move forward. It's so simple. And it was so simple for us when we created that. And we were doing it purely to see, you know, how did all the functions interact, right? What were the interdependencies? What was the score, meaning what were the things flowing through? And at the end of the day, how are we going to put money in the bank? Now, when you're working with leaders and, and you've got your three hag already in place, you, you know, and you got your plan, how, how do you work with leaders when they're faced with tough decisions? We work with leaders and teams every day that have to make tough decisions. What's the process that you use to to keep them aligned to their three-year highly achievable goal that aligns them to the longer 10 to 30-year goal. I think if, if they're that far down the process, then they've probably developed a lot of trust within the leadership team. 
and they're they're prepared to have those difficult conversations. Uh, they're prepared to have those those arguments, those debates, uh, and yeah, you know, sometimes in business you have to make some really really tough decisions, and they're not necessarily nice decisions, but they still have to be made. Uh, and the sooner you make them, the better. Uh, so, I, I think for me in the work that I do, a key part of my role in those situations is is not letting them get away with not making a decision. Now, I have to I have to bring this to the front. I have to shine a spotlight and say, "There's something we're not facing here." Now, let's let's stop. You know, let's stop. We're we're we're, we're skirting around this. You know, we're just we're not facing this head on. Now there's, you know, what, let's get the brutal facts out there. Now this, why are we talking about other things when clearly the big issue is right in front of us? Why are we doing that? Now let's get this on the table. So, well, but in effect, because we're independent and we're able to sort of, you know, to, to approach things from that, it gives them permission to actually say, oh, I'm glad someone else did that. It gives them permission to, for them to think about, well, you know, we've actually been given permission to work through this and we're not going to enjoy this, but coming to a decision is actually better than not doing it because we had this problem three months ago and we had this problem six months ago and you know, we haven't moved forward on this one. So let's get it solved once and for all. So I think two things, first of all, making sure that they built trust. Uh, and secondly, when necessary, bringing that decision to the fore and challenging them for not addressing it. Yeah, I love that. Um, trust is so important. And then, you know, sort of like being the blind spot remover and saying, it's okay, we can talk about it. Now, when we think about that, there's lots of decisions that need to be made when we're growing up, scaling a company. What, what are some of the growing pains that, you know, you've helped companies through in growing their businesses? Like, it, even if you have an example, it's helpful. Because a lot of times we're, you know, everybody wants to grow their business and we get going and it gets a little bit tougher as we keep going. And you, you talked to one earlier, but, but how do you help them through that? What are some of the things that you work through with them? I think one of the things I see quite early on is, you know, when an individual in a leadership team has too many hats. Now in smaller businesses, you know, someone might have finance and IT and they might have legal and uh, so they've actually got three hats and they're, they're trying to do too much or or a CEO still has sales and marketing you know, and probably a little bit of operations for the you know the famous the the, the, the clients that they particularly brought in and giving the, giving them clarity around just the fact that they've got too much on their plate and then saying okay so let's look at which one of these is the next to get delegated off to someone else you know wh when is the right time and do we know who that person is uh, and you know, before we even get to the key function flow map having built out the function chart what i'm what i'm often looking at is now once we have all these accountabilities laid out in the function chart also putting a three or a six or a nine month column next to it and even if we don't know who that person is just put a question mark and say well we know that at a point in time we want to delegate sales off the plate of the ceo so let's just put that out there. You know, we don't know who it is. You know, there was, it might be someone internal. It might be someone external. But we know in nine months' time or six months' time that we need to replace that, that person. Uh, so that means you can start planning for it. You, know, you can start looking for people. You can start sort of, you know, identifying who might fill that, that role. Uh, and if it's up on the wall, then you've got that constant reminder. You know, you've, you know that all you've got to do is get through the next six months as long as you've got someone in mind, as long as someone's going to come in and take on that accountability, it, you've, you, you've only got that accountability for a short period of time. So it gives people the ability to start you know, separating themselves from the individual functions. Um, and you, you asked for other examples of how I've helped um, companies and, and leadership teams address those problems. I think one of the things I see most is reluctance to hire new people because they are concerned about the investment. Uh, and the, the expectation, and, and probably reasonably, that it's going to take three months for them to actually deliver the results. And we don't really know whether they are going to deliver the results. I mean, the, but this is particularly the case with new salespeople. You know, the, the, the thing with salespeople is they know how to sell themselves. 
So you know you can bring in a you know you can bring in a good salesperson ostensibly, and for whatever reason they're not actually going to perform, and you've just lost that time. So I often see people delaying those investments too long, and that actually slows down their growth. If they'd have just made a decision, gone with it, and backed themselves, they would have probably got to the outcome a lot faster. But that all comes back to confidence, doesn't it? If they haven't got the confidence to make the decision. You took the words right out of my mouth. It absolutely comes back to confidence that they have a map, they can see where they're going to make the investment in the the people to help them with the how, right? The who, right? The who for the how. So you've been coaching for a decade, right? You've been coaching for a decade. What's one piece of advice you would give to your younger self uh, when you were just starting out as a coach? I would give this advice to my younger engineer self uh, because um, engineers don't necessarily make great coaches because we're good with process, we're good with models, we're good with logic, we're good with data, but um, we don't necessarily put the time into learning how to be good with people. Um, And I think there's been an absolute transformation in me as an individual, as a person, away from more of the the hard side to the soft side and uh, you know you, you know you've 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 you know my wife Shannon and uh, you know the fact that she now says I'm relatively in touch with who I am as an individual is uh, is completely different to what she would have said 10 10 years ago you know it was all about fact it was all about logic it was all about data and uh, and uh, now yeah I've, I've I've done a lot of work on the soft side so work on the soft side yeah, because we need to keep it in balance. I love that answer. Th- thank you for for sharing that because your love of process, right? I was even thinking back to, you know, where you began, you know, telling us your story, right? Is all, you know, that that structure, that process, all those things. But yes, the soft side is is really, really important. If you could leave our listeners with one or two key takeaways about metronomics and three Hagway and how it can transform their business. What would you say? That's a really tough question. I think, um, the, the, the one I would say always, and I'll, I'll cover this quickly is trust the process. Yeah. It's very different to what anyone else has shown them. It's very different to what they have been taught about how to run and grow businesses. So there's a natural reluctance to actually let go and say, yeah, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do this. I'll go with this. But they should just trust the process because we know it always, always works. And if it doesn't, it's probably the CEO that's the problem. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great way to close this off. And so people can get your book where? Growth with Confidence, where can they find your book? It's on Amazon, so Amazon in your local your local sort of a shop store in in Amazon, um, Amazon US, Canada, Australia. Beautiful. It's pretty much I think it's in forty seven countries. Um, it's an easy read. You you can read it from start to finish in about ninety minutes. Um, now there's there's pictures and everything. I love love pictures. You know I love pictures. Mm-hmm. So congratulations mm-hmm. on that. Love the title, as you would imagine. Um, if people want to learn more about you. And getting in touch with you about coaching, where's the best place for them to reach out to you? Yeah, probably the best place is either um, on jed at crystallizer.com as an email or crystallizer.com, the website. jedroberts.com also goes straight to me as well. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank you for being part of our Metronomics Coach community. Huge contributor to that community. And as well, my co-host on this podcast, Thanks so much for being here, and I look forward to the next time we connect. It's been an absolute blast being a guest on my own podcast. (laughs) Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this proven 20-year-old system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N. O-M-I-C-S dot com. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comments and suggest topics you'd love us to explore the next time. 
Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else the great podcasts are found.